Hi, this is Gary Rubenstein, and today I'd like to take you through a proof that uh, many mathematicians think of as the best proof of all time in math, uh, which is a pretty strong statement, but what makes a proof great in math are uh, three things. One, it needs to be short. Um, there are great proofs that are very long, but um, a great, great proof has to be short so that people can sort of keep it on their minds at, at once. Uh, the second thing is that it should not rely on very complicated math. And the third thing that, in my mind, makes a proof great is that it proves something um, important and not at all obvious. And this proof, by anyone's measure, um, satisfies all three of those characteristics. And it's Euclid's proof that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. I will start with a few uh, definitions for uh, review for people. Um, most numbers are what are called composite. A composite number, like the number 10, is composite because it is possible to multiply two numbers together to equal 10. And 15 is also an example of a composite number because it can be split into 3 times 5. Um, all even numbers um, bigger than 2 are composite because you can take any even number like 20 and you can split it up into 2 times something. Every even number is equal to 2 times another number so 20 is going to be composite. So all the even numbers bigger than 2 are on this list of composite. So right there we have basically half the numbers at least are composite. Um, but as you can see there's also odd numbers on this list like 9 equals 3 times 3 and 15 equals 3 times 5. Uh, the numbers that are not composite are called primes. So numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. There's no way to split 13 up into a product of two numbers unless one of them is 1. So we can say 1 times 13. But you can do that with any number. So if that's the only way to um, turn a number into a, a multiplication problem like that, we say that that number is prime. Now, among uh, the numbers between 2 and 15, um, about 40% of them are prime. So it seems like there are uh, a lot of prime numbers. So among the first few numbers, there are a pretty good percentage of primes. And it may not be surprising at first to learn that there's an infinite number of primes. But it does become more surprising as numbers get bigger what starts to happen is um, the primes start to thin out. Um, for, for example, in between the numbers 113 and 127, there is a string of uh, 13 consecutive composite numbers. I've listed out here all the um, factorizations of the numbers from 114 to 126. As you can see, none of those are prime. And as numbers get even bigger, there are strings of composite numbers, um, hundreds of composite numbers in a row, thousands of composite numbers in a row, even millions of composite numbers in a row. So it, star so it starts to become uh, more surprising that there's an infinite number of primes when you realize this. I've listed out here the uh, percent of the numbers uh, between 1 and 9 is 40 percent of the numbers are prime between 10 and 99, it goes down to 23% of those numbers are prime. From 100 to 999, it's only 16%. From 1,000 to 9,999, it's only 12%. From 10,000 to 99,999, only 9% 9 of those numbers are prime. And then I jumped ahead from 100 million to a billion, which is a lot of numbers, but only 5% of them are prime. So it's getting less as the numbers get bigger. And we could speculate that maybe at some point we will hit a largest prime number, and from then on, all numbers will be composite. Well, Euclid proves that we will never uh, run out of primes, and his proof is very uh, clever, and I'm going to show you how it works after going through a few fundamentals. Uh, the first observation to make is that if you take two numbers and multiply them together, like 3 times 5, you get an answer, in this case it's 15. If you try to divide 15 by 3, 
you'll get 5 with no remainder. When that happens, we say that uh, 15 is divisible by 3. Also, if I divide it by 5, in this case I would get 3, remainder 0. So when there's no remainder, we would say that 15 is divisible by 5. So 15 is divisible by 5, 15 is also divisible by 3. If I take two numbers, multiply them together, and then add 1 to the answer, I get a number. In this case, I get the number 16. If I divide 16 by 3, what you'll notice is that you, you get a remainder in this case. You get a remainder of 1. And that's basically the 1 that I added on here. So 16 is not divisible by 3. And if I try also to divide 16 by 5, I get 3 remainder 1. So 16 is not divisible by 5 or divisible by 3. And in general, if I multiply a bunch of numbers together and I add 1 to the answer, that new number is not going to be divisible by any of the original numbers. So in this case, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 is 210. Add 1, I get 211. And if you were to divide 211 by any of these numbers, we would always get a remainder. In fact, the remainder is always, uh, is always going to be remainder 1. But the main thing is there will be a remainder so that 211 is not divisible by any of those original four numbers. It could be divisible by something else, but not by any of those numbers. And now we're ready for Euclid's proof. Euclid uses a technique called um, indirect proof, where he says, let's assume that there are only a finite number of primes. For instance, let's just say that you thought that the only primes were the numbers 2, 3, 5, and 7, and you thought that was a complete list. He's going to show you that your list is not complete. And he's going to do it by multiplying together all your whole list of primes and adding 1 to it and getting this number 211. Now in this case, 211 is a prime number, and that means that the original list of four things was not complete. Let's say that instead you thought the complete list of primes was 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11. Now when you multiply 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 and you add 1, you get 2,311. And it just so happens that in this case, 2,311 is prime also. So now the question is, how do we know that this thing, after you multiply all the primes together and add 1, how do you know that answer will always be prime? And the answer to that question is, we don't, and it won't always be prime. But that does not ruin the proof. Suppose you thought the whole list of primes was 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. Well, when you multiply those numbers together and add 1, you get 30,031. Now, if it's prime, I'm happy because that allows me to add a prime to the list, showing that the list isn't, was not complete. But if it's not prime, which it's not in this case, well, then I'm even happier because then I get to add two primes to my list. In this case, because 30,031 happens to factor into 59 times 509, I get to add two new primes to my list. You see, um, if a number is composite, it's divisible by some primes, but it cannot be divisible by any of these, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, or 13, because if you divide this by any of those numbers, you get remainder 1. And that's really the beauty of this proof. It, it doesn't matter whether you know the factors of this number or not, or whether you know whether or not it's prime. If it's prime, we could add it to the list. If it's not prime, that means there exist two other primes that can be multiplied together that are both factors of that. And that's why this is considered to be one of the great proofs of all time, if not the best.